This is not a war on drugs. This is a war on my kids that need medical marijuana to make their day pleasant, to help them relieve the symptoms of nausea, to get over the symptoms of chemotherapy, to make them feel good each day they get up in the morning. That's what this war is about. Turn on all your friends, all your relatives, all your grandmas and grandpas. Tell them that this war on marijuana is bullshit. Welcome to the Buyer's Club. We've got today all kinds of food goods. All the food is $5 a piece. Those are peanut butter cookies. These are chocolate chip cookies. Banana bread made by my partner. Three of them. Rice Krispies okay. made by Larry, who also works here at the Buyer's Club. I'm sorry. Right. And so three, uh, uh, cooking three marijuana, three cooking leaf. This is so this way you can cook these things at home for yourself and be able to make your own. And tincture, it's marijuana made uh, blended in in vodka. <laughs> and you just take a few drops of that. And we also have marijuana that you can smoke. On the side. And depending upon the quality of it, determines the price. So of course, this being the most potent, this would be the most, uh, this is the most expensive one with the sliding scale. The two here are California green, and these two to the left are Mexican. And uh, 20, and this is 40. This is 65 and 75. 75 is very, very pungent, very aromatic. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Buyers Club and how it came into being. My best friend, my water brother of 14 years, Jonathan West, had AIDS. Jonathan was taking a myriad of drugs, like every AIDS patient, and all those drugs had severe side effects from constant nausea to appetite suppressant and to making you feel really bad. Uh, the one drug that was really helping Jonathan was marijuana. It was the one drug that allowed him to ease his nausea, to stimulate his appetite. Yes, and it was the one drug that made him feel a little bit better. When Jonathan died, me and my friends collected 16,000 signatures to put a medical marijuana initiative on the ballot. And uh, the people of San Francisco responded by 80% to legalize marijuana as a medicine to help people with AIDS and cancer and multiple sclerosis. The Board of Supervisors, in a resolution 741-92, ordered the district attorney and the chief of police to place the marijuana enforcement laws for medical purposes as to be their lowest priority. Marijuana, although it is illegal, helps people. I'm working to legalize it for these people. And one only has to spend one day at the Buyers Club to know that this is a medicine that works for a lot of people. My kids turned me on when I was in my late 40s, I think. I'm 75 now. Yeah. But I didn't used to smoke it regularly. I just smoked it when they were around and we, we celebrated, you know. Uh -huh. But I was diagnosed with glaucoma a year ago, April. And I've been told for years that it was it would help the pressure of glaucoma. You know, you go blind with glaucoma. Uh huh. <laughs> but I went to my ophthalmologist expecting him to be able to write up out a prescription, and I found out that it was illegal. I hadn't paid all that much attention to it before, you know. I sort of knew it was illegal. Anyway, then I started writing letters to officials and one thing and another. I wrote a letter to. Um, Angela Aliotto, who is the president of San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and I told her, well, I had heard that her husband, who had had cancer and had used marijuana to help him through his death, and uh, anyway, she 
I wrote her a letter about what was on my mind, and she wrote me back and told me to call Dennis. Never even heard of Dennis before. And this was maybe in last January. <laughs> So I called him, and Dennis invited me up, and, and having a glaucoma is a, an in for me. You know, it, we all, we all are, who are members here are, are sick. I have to have a letter of diagnosis from your doctor, HIV, cancer, multiple sclerosis, serious back injuries, paralyzed, um, uh, disc injuries. Uh, essentially, anything that marijuana is good for. If you have the uh, anorexia, marijuana would work. And for pain management, marijuana works. And if you're extremely depressed, instead of Prozac, marijuana does work. I use marijuana because it helps me relax. I was in a really bad car crash in 1987, and my neck and shoulder was injured. And they go into spasm sometimes, and it gives me terrible headaches. So if I smoke some marijuana, it helps all those muscles stay relaxed, and I don't get headaches. And I can avoid it and prevent them rather than wait till it gets really bad. I have an HIV-related kind of arthritis of the spine. It's called Rider's syndrome, and uh, it helps with my pain. It helps me sleep and keep up my appetite. Alleviates nausea, helps um, cal calm me down. Actually. It relaxes me and it helps me uh, control, just kind of manipulate stress instead of letting, letting, uh, letting stress manipulate me. Um, it helps me be more calm and calm. It makes me laugh, you know. It makes me look at the, uh, life in a is it perspective, perhaps? Well, basically, I'm here because uh, uh, three different reasons. I can get pot better quality consistently and cheaper here than I can on the street, which is a more of a practical reason. But uh, in terms of the medical reason, is the fact that I've got something called drusens on the optic nerve. It's basically a sort of wart-like excrescences on my eyes, uh, on my retinal uh, uh, you know, memory. And it, what it does, it, it, uh, it is decreasing my, my field of vision as well as increasing the pressure in my eyes and, and also produces a lack of binocular focus. When I smoke pot, it helps reduce the pressure and brings back my binocular focus so I can see somewhere. Still can't see completely, but I can see a lot better after I've smoked a joint than I did beforehand. So that's why I'm here. Basically, uh, to restore appetite that uh, medication takes away. To make sleep easier as a corrective against insomnia. For spiritual reasons, I acknowledge the need in all human beings to get high, to remove themselves temporarily out of an everyday frame of mind for another frame of mind when that's, you might say, somewhat exalted over the everyday. <laughs> Thank you. It gives me a great deal of relaxation. I'm in a serious, depressed state. I have MS. And it's hard to believe that seven or eight years ago I was able to ride my bicycle from here to Santa Cruz. <laughs> This place is, is really great to get marijuana from because, for one thing, you don't have to take your chances out on the street, like going to Dolores Park, for example, where you're never quite sure what quality you're getting or, <laughs> or if you're going to be robbed or it's just uh, dangerous. This is, this is a safe place, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Reality is the medical marijuana clubs have operated without interference from local police or federal drug agents. Our manpower doesn't permit uh, to really operate at the street level. So it is a low priority right now? Right? Yes, it would be. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really think uh, the individuals involved with that program are, are very sincere and uh, they're trying to do something to alleviate their pain you know, versus other methods and, uh, and, 
I, I think it's something that the, uh, the, 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 the justice system has not responded to that particular social need yet. Do you want some more? Yeah. Um, I got involved with uh, Shanti to begin with when the epidemic first broke. And from there, I went to San Francisco General Hospital, the AIDS outpatient ward. I've been there, I call them all my kids because any one of them could have been. They could have been yours, they could have been anybody in this room. And um, uh, so I was baking at a safe house. I was baking for about 20 or 25 kids. Whatever I could, whenever I could get enough leaf donated, I would bake as many brownies as I could for the leaf that was donated. And I would deliver them to kids that, with AIDS, free of charge. And then, of course, I got busted, and that seemed to be the shocker around the world for medical marijuana. They wish they'd never, ever busted me. So my kid was selling a little marijuana on the side to, um, to uh, you know, for a little extra okay. income, and they were basically after him, and I was up there baking that day, and they got me too, and thought they, yay, they said, guess who we've got here, Brownie Mary, and they thought that was a big deal, however, it really backfired on them. The, the book is basically Dennis's and all the other people that made contributions to it. My contribution was just the uh, recipes and the story of my active activism. There's all kinds of good recipes in the book. There's a great shrimp casserole, there's a rice side dish, there's a black bean soup, macaroni and cheese, hemp salad dressing, chestnut stuffing, there's a good recipe for chocolate chips. And, and uh, so we all did this book and put it together and we've sold almost 5,000 copies. We're just about out and going into the second edition. Right now we have 22 people working here, from the bakers to uh, scale people to doormen and to people that just roll the joints for the people. And uh, everyone that works here has either got AIDS, cancer, or multiple sclerosis. We hire from the community to serve the community. Do you have any screens for this? Yeah, yeah. I'm, the, I'm the baker. I, I make the cookies. Yeah, there, there are several ways of, of doing it. Like THC, the leaf is, is um, THC is dilutable in, in, in um, any kind of um, oil or butter. And um, there's another way of, of using alcohol and um, increasing the potency, which I'm which I'm just like experimenting with. So far, I've just like used my leaf in, in a crock pot with butter, let it soak overnight, and then get magnificent um, results from it. So I'm just trying to find some yeah. place to go. It's a medical marijuana brownie, it says here right on the label. Okay. And uh, they don't quite have the fact statement on there yet. <laughs> the guy said it was really good and I'm going to have one in there. Basically, I'm actually only going to have half of it because a whole one would make me feel sleepy, too sleepy. And uh, I'd rather do it at home, the whole thing at home. These aren't Mary's brownies. These are uh, somebody else makes these. Uh -huh. If if I get a chance to get one of Mary's brownies, those are, those are the best. The smoking, uh, it, you know, it gives me that right away feeling. But this actually takes an hour and a half or so to really start to maybe uh, to feel it. I have um, HIV. Matter of fact, the drugs that the surgeons gave me to alleviate the pain before and after surgery are toxic and marijuana isn't. So I became an addict of prescription drugs. I really never used marijuana in my life. I was 220 pounds. I had p terrible pain from my surgery. I couldn't even move without pain. Now I'm 170 pounds. I bike 20 to 30 miles a day in rural Butte County without that much pain. I am in school and getting a 4.0 GPA in a very hard graduate program. I'm 73 years old. 
I've been smoking pot for 60 years. I like to eat it too. I started to smoke pocket pot. It was not considered a drug, but rather a herb. My mother used to make take the stems and make tea out of it and give it to us on honey for our menstrual pains. It's, some people say that Mexican is harsher to smoke, that the taste is uh -huh. more irritating. And that's really the, probably the key difference between green bud and Mexican pot. Is that a green bud, usually you, your high is a little bit longer, where in Mexican you need to smoke some more relatively soon to keep your buzz. And a lot of people are not able to smoke it because of their lungs, because of their respiratory systems and, and hearts, what have you, and, and, and smoking is bad for you. So eating it really is becoming more and more popular and more and more creative, you know, every, like these actually really caught on, these Rice Krispies, you know, these really caught on, it somehow it tastes right, the taste of marijuana is odd, it doesn't go with everything. Nothing tops homemade, and like this, this is uh, an ounce of marijuana, and it's the shake and the leaf from the flowers that, that this is. But this is enough pot, we sell this for, what, $15, enough pot to make uh, a batch of brownies, about 12 doses. Homemade is, is really good because when you first take it out of the oven and it's hot, it is heated, and it's like, it's like slightly smoldering, you know, there in this little baked form and it's very, very potent. So a batch of brownies, when you take those brownies out and you eat one of those brownies, that's like way more than enough. Mostly, if I'm going to eat it, I probably would eat it in a cookie form, usually brownie. Or sometimes I might make something special like a pancakes, but usually I smoke it. I prefer okay. to smoke it. He don't care, he's not picky. <laughs> he's not picky. Here, let me here. Keep going. No, not this one. You're hungry, aren't you? Here you go. There's your little. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where are you? 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 I think to effectively you're going to need the whole thing. Oh, is it like a lot weaker than it's Well, it's two grams in there, so I don't know. You know well, what's in the banana bread? Two, 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 and two and a half. Two and a half. Okay, because like I gave, I must have had like the smallest piece. It was like, it wasn't even a quarter of a piece. And I was just like, ooh, and I gave that much to my mom. And she was just like, she passed it. <laughs> really. Well, you know, well, like, I'm probably going to use more than you. Yeah, exactly. Do so, so, you think maybe half? Or sure. I just don't, you know, like, she's like a hardcore. Well, start off with your smallest amount, yeah. you know. Give her, like, a quarter of it. Okay. If it doesn't okay. work, then you give her another quarter. Okay. Okay, actually. Yeah. I'm the cannabis bias club here. Everything here has medicinal value. Everything here is available to the members. It's calculated by weight. At the same way we buy it. And as you can see, we have a chart. And how much is everything? Stems in there. Different grades. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's a high yeah. art, as a matter of fact, of growing in marijuana. Some of these are beautifully tendered and manicured. You can tell people really put a lot of energy into their gardens. They're really, it's a little bit less quality because the flowers that crumble and dry differently. I was diagnosed in April of, well, I was HIV positive in April of 89, and I was diagnosed in, with AIDS uh, May of last year. And I've gained approximately 15 pounds in six weeks. So it's very good for me, because I was down, I lost almost 20 pounds. Hey, my name is Beth, and I work here. Uh, I do a variety of things, greeting people, signing them up, uh, giving them hugs, helping them at the counter, showing them around. I am HIV positive myself. I love that we're like a big family. 
Uh, the people that come in here, uh, when they leave, they feel just a little bit more loved and at ease than they did when they came in. I've seen people improve. I've seen people come in having to be carried up the stairs, and I've seen people come in later, these same people come in later with just walking up the stairs with maybe a little bit of help. Uh, I've seen definite improvement. I've experienced this myself. Um, I've just seen a lot of miracles, a lot of miracles here. One of us does. They can get 3,100 very sick people searching their parks for marijuana. They get 3,100 people in their jails. These people are at the bottom in the winter of their life. They deserve every respect society can give them. I may have to pay a price someday go to prison for what I'm doing. But I believe in what I'm doing. The club is open. One just has to be here one day to know that we are doing the right thing. That we are helping people in a crisis time of their life. And you can say this club is about marijuana, but it is really about love and passion. we run out of here would be Americans for Compassionate Use, uh, Californians for Compassionate Use. We feel calls from all over America. Every day we get calls from people out there that want information on this topic. And we've been trying in our own humble little way to, to influence national policy in this area as best we as a citizen activist group can do. <laughs> it was passed by both houses of the California State Legislature by a nice margin. It was a bipartisan vote. Republicans in both houses passed this bill. We, we lobbied for this bill. Uh, I had the honor of going up there with Dennis on numerous occasions and watching some of the patients also go up there and testify for the bill. And that was quite a process. I mean, Dennis actually and some of the patients went door to door, legislature to legislature. And it was quite a thing to see because Dennis is a master. And this was something I, we'd step back and generally watch. He really had to see this to, to understand the, the power of speech. Because it was, his voice would go up, and the infectiousness of his uh, characteristic of what he was explaining would go up. And, and these offices aren't that big. Usually, you've got another legislator in the back room. Next thing you know, you've got Dennis talking directly and discoursing directly with these legislators without, you know, just, just pure, pure on its own merits and, and really really swaying them with the conviction of argument. It was really something to see. We didn't personally get to see the governor, and we brought 30 patients by, and we presented the governor, Dennis presented the governor through his office with a major uh, pile of materials in support of the bill. Californians for Compassionate Use is spearheading a statewide ballot initiative. The vote will take place in November of 1996. The voters in the state of California will at that point be able to decide if it's okay for a sick person uh, to grow a couple of plants of marijuana and use it for medicine with the oversight of their physician.
They sent him to the club. Even the police have a pistol support on him. Do it! No! They're not going to do it. I'm not going silently into the night. I will be dragged into that building. I am fighting for your rights, for any medicine you have in the sunset of your life. I'm here to protect you. And if they arrest me, they are arresting you. If they close these clubs, people will surely die. And they have to know that because we know that. We've watched our friends and our families puke themselves to death on the modern medical miracles of today's science. And we know this herb helps them and we're not going to let them close the club. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm also not going to let Dennis Perone go to jail alone. That's right! I started selling marijuana in 1970, and I paid a dear price for it, including getting arrested, jailed, huge jury trials. 1977, again, I was arrested for running the Big Top Pot supermarket. It was kind of the one-stop shopping. Three scales, no waiting, treated like a king. And my friend Harvey Milk and I conspired to legalize marijuana on the 1978 ballot by Proposition W. We won that vote by 58%. And Harvey Milk, in, in a note to my jail cell, told me he was going to see that it was enforced and that mo no city funds were going to be allocated to enforce the marijuana laws. But that wasn't to be because Harvey Milk was gunned down by an assassin's bullet. And it also put a bullet through the marijuana movement's heart because, see, Harvey was our spokesman. Moving on to my wall, this is a poster of when I ran for charter commissioner. I ran for charter commissioner when I was in jail for selling marijuana from the pot supermarket. And Harvey Milk endorsed me for that race. I unfortunately lost. But not by much, and not before Dan White denounced me and Harvey Milk in front of the Board of Supervisors. At the same time, I had Proposition W on the ballot. I, unfortunately, was in jail for the November election, so I did see my initiative win by 58%, and myself come within 1,500 votes of actually winning a seat on the Charter Commissioner. And now, my restaurant, and it was the Island Restaurant, it was in the heart of the Castro District in Harvey Milk's headquarters for a 75 and 76 assembly race. He used my restaurant as his uh, campaign headquarters for that race. And he didn't win that race, but that was not to be because he was meant, he was meant to win the race in 1977 when he became the first openly gay elected supervisor, ele elected official in the whole country. And his legacy was one of love and community. He showed the world a lot of hope and compassion.